What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the High Performance Fatherhood Podcast. I always say I'm excited, but this guy has been on my list for a minute. He finally came through. <laughs> but I've, I've known Anton for, um, man, what is it, like 20? Man, 20 plus years, 20 bro. 20 plus, it's been a minute, right? Right. Um, somebody I, I absolutely respect and... Um, you know, I, I wanted to have him on the show because I knew he would be able to offer us a lot of insight, a lot of wisdom um, as to this thing we call fatherhood, this journey, um, and to give a different perspective. Um, you guys know this thing is all about high-performance fatherhood, helping us to not only live at an optimal level in er other areas of our lives, but to pour into other people uh, so we can grow together. But, but without further ado, I want to welcome Anton Davis to the show. What's going on, brother? Hey, what's happening, bro? I'm glad to be here. Cool. Um, you know, because I know it's been a minute, and I should have been on here sooner. So, good, man, <laughs> man I'm just appreciative to it's, be here. It's all good, man. Um, we're going to jump into it, man, because I want to respect your time. Um, you know, for me, I when you're when you're growing up and you are in the middle of life, you don't, especially as a young man, you don't really think about, especially before your dad, <clears throat> you don't really think about the dynamics of fatherhood. You may be thinking about what you have, what you don't have, but you never really think about, you just say, okay, I'm good. You know, a lot of us would say, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I can, you know, I'm dealing with it. Life is okay, you know? Um, and I think that's, and we'll talk about that, but I think that's one of the most dangerous places you can be in is, is thinking that life's just okay because you can manage it and you don't have the foresight to see into the future. but. What I want to ask you and talk to you about is what was your, as a young man growing up, what was your experience from fatherhood or that representation in your home or like what was that for you growing up um, as a young man? Man, I'm glad you asked me that question, Troy. It's like this. <clears throat> growing up for me, being a native Washingtonian and growing up in Southeast D.C., it was like, and I shared this with my students. My dad was never there, man. And so I grew up with my mom, a strong mother, but I had my coaches, I had my granddad, my uncles. They stepped in the gap. Mm -hmm. And I watched them. I watched the consistency. I saw how they reared men. I saw how my coaches literally, man, they didn't spare us a quarter. It was just like, man, get out there and run those laps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we started, you know, complaining. It's like, man, stop the complaining. Or if you can't fulfill that, then you're off the team. They were just strong men. And it was just like my uncle's the same way. My friend's dad, I can remember we was up at Crystal Skates, man. And, you know, I shared this story. We were, like, trying to snatch pylons to, to, to sell them to, like, you know, some of the go-go bands or whatever, right? Right. The jump outs came down the hill. They got us. Man, we sitting in there, you know, and I'm like, oh, man. So, actually, it was like my, our boy's dad popped up. And uh, Damon, if you listening, you out there. Mr. Young came. And when I tell you, man, this dude lit our chest up, man. I mean, all of us, bam, bam. And it was just like, it was like a big grizzly bear type dude, man. Right, right. And it was just like, I looked, I said, oh, man, that dude about to hit me. <laughs> Pow, right? And it was just like, so for that, we always had that strong example. We saw hardworking dudes in Southeast, right? So the stigma that's attached is unfair because there are so many productive, positive people coming out east of the river. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this, man. We saw them going to work, being consistent, you know, being there at home, just being that role model, making sure, you know, my boys did their homework. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, and like I said, my granddad, he was just like, man, did you do your homework? My uncle, same thing, my, my older cousin. So I didn't have a choice mm -hmm. but to be the man that I am today mm -hmm. because of the example we had growing up. And I just said, I didn't have hatred for my dad, man. I was just like, I don't know why he chose to do what he did, but for me, I knew I wasn't gonna be that man. You know, I looked at him as the example I didn't want to follow. Okay. But I never was bitter about it, and that's what kind of helped set the background or set the tone for who I am today. Did you did you ever have a relationship with him or not really or You know what? It's it's funny. My mom said that I saw him twice in my life. 
I don't even remember, bro. Sound like me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Man, it was like my uncle told me he was a great ball player. He was a great athlete. I guess that's where the athleticism came from. But outside of that, never saw him. And I went looking for him. You know, I tried like all the apps and all of that stuff to try to find where he is. Mm -hmm. Have not had any luck, man. Talked to my mom. My mom gave me some leads. I don't even know if he's still living. When was the last time you, you, you sought him out? Uh... Probably last, ago. probably last year. Wow, okay. last year, and I tried, and it was one day then after the next. So I'm kind of my, you know, my hands are tied right now. Yeah, that's something I've, I've had. A, um, you know, man, it, it's like I tell people, it goes back to that. You know, I'm I'm good, I'm that, but you know, you know when you have certain deficiencies in your life or parts where you really can't trace back. It's almost like, you know, you wonder, I wonder if my dad did this. I wonder, you know, where do I get this trait from? Where, you know, and, and Kelly's always told me, she's like, oh, you should reach out. You know what I'm saying? You know, you should, you know, cause I, I don't even think I've ever shared this publicly, but um, for my not, I have a sister out there that I've never met, you know? And um, for me, Finding this out in my 20s was rough, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was like, man, I'm, well, I've already started this journey. But then I have the mindset of I've seen other people's, and maybe it worked out, but I've seen other people's families get destroyed because information comes in, right? And I was like, all right, how would I feel if, you know, someone showed up and it's like well you never know they could be in the same boat i'm like but yeah but i do know my biological dad has passed away passed away years ago so it wasn't like you know you you come in and people are like, well you're gonna they're gonna know as soon as they see you because you know you look like them so it's been that whole battle of just not wanting to be a disruptor i mean we're already this far along in life so it's just kind of like but I've, I've always wonder how people handle that you know what i'm saying and because we're we're shaped by our environments exactly. or lack thereof an, of an environment, you know? And so I've, I've always been curious when I hear other dads say that they really didn't have that relationship and, you know, how has it shaped you? Because even as a dad, like you got two girls. Right. And so like how, like when you found out one that you were going to be a dad and then you found out you were having daughters, like what was that? How did you feel? Like, were you ready or were you some apprehension as far as you, not just having a kid? How, how did you feel during that time? Well, before I answer that, <clears throat> I just want to say this. I have a brother and a sister out there, too. <laughs> so, okay. That I never met. Okay. So, I mean, okay. we, so we, we share that commonality as okay. well. Okay. Okay. But as far as the daughters, um, I wasn't nervous, man. It was like, for me, it was late. <clears throat> because a lot of my friends had already had kids. Mm -hmm. So my daughters were born at 40. Okay. Right, because okay. they're 15 now. Wow. So it was just like, when they came along, I looked and I said, okay, man, I'm having twin girls, man, that's cool, right? Right. right. And um, so then it was just like a thing of, I wanted to be protective. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure uh, that I could be that great example. Mm -hmm. You know, because I kept at the forefront, my dad not being there. So I was just like, I want to make sure that they have every opportunity. I want to make sure that they go to very good schools, that they have a good work ethic, um, that they have confidence, and that as a dad, like my thing was, I wanted to be the first person to give him flowers. I wanted to be the first person to take him on a date, you know, that kind of thing. So later on in life, they wouldn't be needy mm -hmm. because we know – when we come across needy women because dad wasn't there in her life. And my thing was, I just want you guys to be consistent. I want you guys to be hard workers. I want you guys to maximize your potential. Mm -hmm. I want you guys to get in school and focus because, you know, we often say that the world is your oyster. You can extract whatever size pearl you want. Mm. Right. But, you have to be consistent, and you got to know that your dad and your mother, that we love you, and that we are behind every decision that you make, you know, and we're going to support you. We just want you to be finishers. If you start something, finish it. 
right? And even if you never do that activity again, just make sure that for that season, you give it your best. Mm -hmm. So now when I see my daughters, like I, you know, when they had, they have like work to do for the summer mm -hmm. before they go back for their sophomore year, they have like 262 assignments to complete. So I was like, wow, man, they attacking that thing like it's, like it's nothing. They complain for a high second. And every morning you see them getting up, they write in, write in them books, reading the novels, doing, you know, the honors, because I think they're in the honors of algebra two or something like that. But they're knocking it out. And, um, you know, I just look at that and say, okay, continue being that way. Because with that kind of work ethic, nothing can stop you. Mm -hmm. So I want them to, to, to understand what love is. You know what I mean? What agape love is as far as a father to his daughters. Unconditional love. It's like I'm there for you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to support you. When you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to let you know about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because the world is not going to give you, uh, they're not going to be soft on you. The world is not going to pat you on your shoulders and say, that's okay. The world is going to make it really hard for you. As we can see right now, what's, what, what's happening in the political realm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so happy that Kamala is running for president. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm so happy so these young girls can see that. Anything is possible. Just like when we saw President Barack Obama win a presidency as men, it's just like, oh yeah, he won. So that opportunity is afforded to everybody, mm -hmm. right? If you work hard enough, we just have to have that mindset that it's power, it's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. So for both of them, I'm like, okay, you guys, y'all the Wonder Twins, mm -hmm. the M&Ms. Y'all can do whatever you want to do, man. It's Y'all work together. Right, right, right. You love and be a support system for you and know that we're there for you. And as a dad, it's all I wanted them to know, just to have that relationship with them, that your dad is there for you and I'll do anything for you, but right, work right. hard. You know what right. I mean? And like we said before we started this, Troy, right. it's like this. I always say to them, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Right. Bottom line. Right, right. Man, I want to go back because I really, you know, oof, man, I've had to actually mute people on Facebook because um, I didn't want to get triggered and especially this time time of year man because I, I you know it's it's weird the last election you know was just a bunch of craziness and we all all know what that was about and we've been in a, we've been in an election cycle now for a little while it's not like it just started with Kamala right it's, right so but the thing that really bothered me and and it's you know, you have daughters, so you can understand, you know, and with the women in my household, that, that kind of shaped my perspective. It was just kind of like, all right, if you're going to make it about politics, that's fine. You do pick which I don't really care. But when you start attacking or the subliminal comments or different things to where I feel a man should. You shouldn't be comfortable as a man just publicly saying things about a woman that's outside the bounds of like say politics, the racial undertones, the different, you know, the, the, the different acronyms that are used to, it's been amazing to me that people don't either think that you're smart enough to really see it or they're not smart enough to really understand what it is that they're saying. And so as a dad, it's like you instantly go into this protection mode because exactly. it's like, dude, like, Hey man, that's not however you think. I've really when she got into the race, man, she got a husband, she got a security detail, she got so it wasn't that type of protection I'm talking about. It was the our women like, yo, this this really what y'all go through out here at work, the 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 things that you deal with in the workplace that we don't discuss. You know, you come home and you may tell us about it. But you're like, okay, we need to do X, Y, and Z. But you see this position coming from men now, and it's like, wait a minute, you know. And then they want to make everything about race. And it's not so much about race. It's just about honor and respect. You know, you, you're supposed to be like that toward, I believe, females, period. Not just this one. I don't care if it was a, you know, a Caucasian candidate running. I don't, it's like, you shouldn't be comfortable as a man in gate initiating those types of things. If you're doing something to defend yourself, all right, whatever. But if you're the one kind of putting it out there, 
I had a problem with it, but I I said all that to say I know it stems from having a wife, having a daughter. Right. I'm a little bit more keen, or it irritates me a little bit more because I wouldn't want them going through that and their endeavors in life, whether you know work or you know whatever the ambition, sport, whatever it is. I wouldn't want them to be disqualified or to be looked at as less than just because of who they are. Things that's outside of their control. You know what I mean? You you, you can't control those things. So. I thought I thought it was interesting that you said that. Um, sports, man, it, it's funny because uh, the last day I talked to sports was a part of that. What is your your view in sports at, and particularly with our youth, like how it benefits them? Ooh, bro. Um, you know, like what, what's your, what's your, where are you at with that? Man, let me tell you, great question, bro. For me, and I was just talking about it this morning prior to coming here with you. And we were talking about it. We alluded to it to an extent. This generation, man, these kids are so obese, so unhealthy. And it's just like, so for me, and not just the kids, but our country, mm -hmm. you know, just, just the citizens in our country. And I know I belong to a group called uh, KIP, mm -hmm. right? And it stands for Keep It Pushing, Team KIP. And it was started by Mo Bowie. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it, you know, we talk about getting up, out, and active and staying relevant. The most important thing with these kids is, like, do something. Mm -hmm. These kids are so, I guess, I'm going to say imprisoned, man, by social media mm -hmm. and technology that they sit all day. Mm -hmm. And it's like, get outside, get some exercise. You know, when we came up, Troy, you know how it was. Mm -hmm. We were out there playing basketball, pounding the pavement, you know, sun up and sun down. I just told my son. Right. We came in. The lights coming on, street lights was our sign to come in the house. Right. And it was like, and if not, you know, mom, my mom used to be like, hey, Todd. She called it all across <laughs> the community. Hey, Todd. I'm sitting there like, go ahead, mom. What you doing? You know, my friend's like, man, Anton got to punch that clock, right? Yeah, so I used yeah. to hear that all the time. But I knew if I ain't get inside, man, my mom was going head hunt me, bro. Right, it was going right, to be a hatchet. Right, right, so right, it was just right. like, I knew to respect that. So I got in the house, but we were out, man. We had to hoop it up tournaments. We had all that stuff coming up, man. And it was like a lot of us back then, CYO was big, Catholic Youth Organization, mm -hmm. right? So we played football, ran track. I can remember playing football with St. Margaret's mm -hmm. and playing teams like St. Camilla, St. Saint, Saint Jerome, St. John the Baptist, you know, Assumption, mm -hmm. and uh, St. Thomas More. Mm -hmm. And we played all those teams, and it kept us busy. Same thing with basketball. You name it, we did it. And then in the summertime, the Nationals, man, it was like running in the Nationals and the East Coast and, and all of that. And it's just like, but these kids now, you talk to them, man, what sport you doing? Oh, I'm not doing anything. And I just think it's so important because, number one, it teaches leadership. Mm -hmm. Playing team sports is so, it's so imperative, man. It's so, so important because you learn life skills. You learn how to solve problems. You learn strategies. You learn how to be a leader mm -hmm. you know you learn how to follow mm -hmm. because sometimes you can't be a leader unless you know how to follow and you can't follow unless you know how to be a leader right right those paradigms are so important for growing up and being successful later in life because that's what helped us and that's why a lot of us are so balanced right but a lot of these kids don't have that balance man they're out of kilter because they're not doing anything they're not involved i talk to parents as an assistant principal and parents would say, Mr. Davis, I need to get my child in this activity or I need to get him in this activity because he sits down all the time. Or, you know, I had a mom say about her son, mm -hmm. man, my son is so soft. And I said, no, nah, mom, don't say that. She said, yeah, he's soft, Mr. Davis. <laughs> right? That's an automatic sign. She grew up and I do. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? And I was just like this. I said, mom, you know, what do you want him to do? And she said, I'm thinking about putting him in boxing or martial arts. I said, do it. Mm -hmm. I said, it's no if, ands, or buts. Don't say I'm thinking about it. Put them in it. Mm -hmm. And I said, sometimes, you know, they might complain and fuss and fight. I said, my mom, i never forget it. I said, I got in trouble one time. And my mom said, that's it. You playing sports. Mm -hmm. and, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And it was just like that was a part of my routine all the way, going all the way up to college. And it's just like, so, Troy, yeah, that's, that's where it's important. All of these kids out here need to be in some type of activity. It doesn't necessarily have to be sports. It can be, you know, piano, it can be choir, it can be, but something. Mm -hmm. They need to be involved in something. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Because what what was that saying, man? Um, 
um, what is it? An inactive mind is a devil's playground yeah, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Idle mind. Idle mind. That's yep, it. Yep. Idle mind is the devil's playground. So they need something. And that's, right. that's what's going on right now. And that's what I see. Because when I talk to many of these kids right now in the school, man, you play ball? Nah, Mr. Davis, I don't play ball. So what do you do? Well, I play ball on my computer. <laughs> but playing ball on your computer is not the same as actually doing it. Right. And you see it. Like when I first started at Rosaryville years ago, you know, you, you see a difference. You see a transition. Mm -hmm. Those kids were highly athletic. Man, you see kids now, man, they shooting layups over the backboard, you know, over the backboard. Mm -hmm. Or you throw the kid a football and bounce off his chest. It's like, man, you don't know how to catch the ball. Mm -hmm. Nah, Mr. Davis, I don't play football. So I just think that's where we come in as men and as dads, man. You know, literally. And even if we don't know how to play the sport, put them in the sport so they can be with people who know how, so they can Mm -hmm. train them. But... You know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of going long on this, but I'm passionate. Right, right, right. I'm For passionate sure. about it. And it's just like, just like, you know, with you, Troy, you know, you see it. I mean, because you do, you do the same thing. And all dads, man, it's so important. If you have daughters or you have sons, spend time, man, whatever it is. You know, listen to what your children are saying. Because I know with my daughters, my daughters was like, Daddy, we want to we wanna play this. They've tried every sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, they play flag football. They play soccer. They play, you know, they've done karate, volleyball. I mean, tennis, swimming. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they have sports that they love to play. So, yeah, give them an opportunity because that's what's going to help our kids, man. It's not just being academically inclined. That's only one part of the, um, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm-hmm. One part of the equation, mm-hmm. um, academics. You need the other part. You need to socialize. You need to do those things. And our kids are just not doing it. So when you go to Six Flags, that's why you see those kids. And right. you're like, man, why that dude so big, man? Yeah. Right? It's sad, man. <laughs> because it's, it almost feels like there's no oversight. Right. Like Six Flags for us especially, you know, we call it Wild World Part Two. But, exactly. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a daycare, you know. Parents cool, kids go up there, they there all day or whatever, you know. I mean, I'm not gonna sit up here and say I don't eat the food sometimes when we go. But you look at like what they just eating all day, eating it's like, yo, like nachos. Right, or hot dog or, or fry and there's nothing wrong with that, but if you're right. already there, it's kinda like there's no curtailing it, right? Like I I know sugar is a big deal with us, right? Um and this we're gonna transition into this um thing about fitness because you know, man, one of the things um, you know because obviously I've seen you is you're, especially over the pandemic, right, you just got slammed into fitness. I'm like, this dude, like, I ain't even up good yet. This man <laughs> I cranked out about 200 push-ups. And, you know, was my question to you was, was there a life event that happened for you that got you on this track you're on now, or was it just a realization that you just had that you needed to do. I'm glad you brought that up because this is important for men. I've been super healthy my entire life, bro. And it's like, and then one day um, I was at G, you know, George Washington having a physical. So, you know, I left and then I got a call from my doctor that said, man, I want you to come back because your PSA level is kind of elevated. And I said, you know, first of all, I'm like, what's that? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So he's explaining to me what it is and you know you're you know dealing with um your numbers as far as uh prostate your mm-hmm. prostate numbers and you know cancer and all that stuff so i had to do a biopsy so when i came back and talked to him again he said man you know you had prostate cancer mm-hmm. so i was just like what you know because it just man it blew my mind so then they started setting me up because they were just like man look we want to you know do the surgery and blah, blah, blah. So I had the surgery. And, you know, and then they wanted to do, like, the radiation. Not the chemo, the radiation. Because mm-hmm. chemo is, like, another step above that. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to do radiation and all of that. So the way they was having it set up and I did research, I said, man, I'm leaving. I went over to Sibley. So when I went to Sibley and they did everything and, you know, I was I was good, um, it just totally blew my mind. And I I just was like... And I didn't want to tell anybody. And not because I was ashamed. I didn't want people to worry. 
right? I okay. was like, man, I don't want people to worry. But then, man, I'm gonna tell you, Holy Spirit was talking to me. God was just like, nah, man, you gotta be a testimony. You gotta let people know. So I slowly, so even with KIP, when we would do the walks, mm -hmm. you know, Mo was like, man, he said, Slim, you need to let these people know what's going on with you because we need to save men. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to save, and also women as well. We need to let them know that we're not alone, that we have support systems out there. So it's important for men to know, get your prostate checked, man. Don't play around with that because that's one thing that takes a lot of us out here. So once I found out about that, Troy, you know what I'm saying? It was just like, um, and plus before then, you know, being a track runner and, you know, track was my life. And then I love football and I played a lot of the different sports. So it wasn't nothing for me to start, you know, exercising. But that wasn't the only reason. The other caveat for me was it was the pandemic. And I knew so many people were closed in. So many people were afraid. And I was just like, man, I need to do something to get people to change their mental, you know, to change their thinking, to understand that if you eat right and you exercise right, you're not going to get um, COVID because COVID had a lot to do with your diet. Mm -hmm. Because if you eating like red meats and that kind of thing, it was funny because I kind of did a study and checking the study out, it seemed as though people who had meat heavy diets were catching COVID mm -hmm. and vegans were not. And at that time I was vegan and it didn't, you know, and everyone that I knew that or who has a vegan diet, wow. it didn't, it didn't attack them. They didn't catch it. So man, I started just cranking out and doing the push-ups and the jump rope and the pull-ups and I will post the videos. And, you know, I was just like, and then people would hit me up and they would start jumping rope. And I would see people posting their videos on, you know, on my page. And I was like, hey, man, this thing is doing, you know, making a big difference. And that's when Mo came along and said, hey, man, you know, get with me on Team KIP. And Mo was always like a big brother to me. Mm -hmm. So I said to Mo, I said, yeah, okay, bet. And then other cats. So it was like the Damatha contingent came in, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had the, the Curl and, you know, all, all the WCAC that's school brothers. That's all of us up. started coming together. Right. And then you had people and then like one of my boys, Steve Hood. Steve Hood checked in. And I mean, he was just like, you know, we talked and then it was just like um, Greg Steed, who graduated with me. And Greg is, uh, he was on that all black uh, referee team in the NFL when mm -hmm. they made history. He mm -hmm. was a part of that. Okay. And it was just like, so a lot of these cats started jumping in. Then you had the inner high brothers who played. They started jumping in. Right, right. So it developed into this big family. With the KIP, so now Troy, we got what over two thousand folk. I mean, you even are a part of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm glad you are a part of that, and I see you doing your thing too. So it's just like as fathers, the bottom line is, you know, what's what's not taught is caught, right? Right. Bottom line. So it's just like so we got to get out there as teachers, and we have to model it, and we have to be strong and self to know yeah. that we got to get out there and do something. So for me. That's what it was. And I say, with, you know, proudly, it's like, I'm a survivor and other men can survive too. Mm -hmm. Get your prostate checked. Mm -hmm. Don't play with your prostate, man. And I say that with a smile on my face because I want y'all here, man. And I want you here because you have people who are dependent upon you, family, friends, other individuals, because a lot of us are stalwarts in our community. Mm -hmm. We make a difference, mm -hmm. right? And it's just like that thing that Miss Hooper would do, our counselor at uh, Rosaryville. Mm -hmm. She would do this thing called Men Make a Difference. And I'm going to take that a step farther. I mean, beyond that, fathers make a difference, right? So, but if we're not here, then we can't make that difference. Right. So that's what that was about. Man, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because, you know, you and I talked off camera prior to recording and even with my son, it was like, you know, um, and I know they're like the, the last dad I talked to, we talked about this. You know, when you have a daughter that's super athletic and competitive, it can automatically put that pressure on, all right, son, what, what we doing? You know what I mean? And so I've had to find things. Um, he's a lot like me in that he's apprehensive if he don't think he can be good at it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he, he if he thinks he can be good at it, he's going to do it. Like, mm -hmm. but it, it's that getting into it, working through the rust and getting all that going. But one thing that I noticed that he has taken pride in is going to the gym with me. And 
we get in the gym, and you know, it's like I let him have his moments. He, you know, do a little workout. He'll kind of get in the mirror and kind of look at us. I'm like, okay, because man, the identity we have gotten away from. Um, what do you call it? We've gotten away from healthy male identity. Oh, most definitely. In our society, where it's almost like masculine energy is like a bad thing, you know. And so I want him, like I said, son, you, this was, he just turned 15. So you're about to be 15 now. You're going into school. I said, if you do this and you take advantage of the situation, we up here all the time anyway at the gym because that's where, you know, his sister trains. So we work out. Right. And I'm like, if you do this now, dude, you might not see it now, but in your later sophomore year, your junior year, when you start walking around and, you start looking different and your height start popping and chest. I said, you're going to be glad that you put this work in now. So he's, he's found or he's finding his joy in fitness, which is, is really good. Um, for me, it was just kind of like, all right, man, when I was college, I was like 216 high school. I was like, 206. You know, back in high school, you just want to be 200 pounds. I just want to be, you know, I was tall. Right. Well, t- tall to those standards. Now, these youngins today, they like 6'8". You know, Man, they just, trees. Right. I'm just like, I'm short. Like, I'm an NBA right. point guard. I was a center in high school. Right, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, but I said all that to say the, the physical men don't really check. Like, I went and had the exam my 49. It was during COVID. It was like I'm due. It's probably like 40. It's been a few years. They said, oh, you can start early now, right? I just went and had it done. So, But I found myself, when I need to reschedule again, but I found myself asking my friends, yo, man, you gone? Have you have you gone and get checked yet? No, I need to scan. I said, dude, you older than me. Go get checked. Yeah, stop procrastinating. Go get checked. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Because that, from, from what I've heard, that's what took my pops out. Right. So I've I've always been like, all right, let me make sure, you know what I'm doing, supposed to do and try to and try to um, and try to eat right. One thing, man, I want to talk to you about because I'm kind of saving something for the end. All right. That's a bet. That's a bet. But we're going to we're going to talk about this one right now. What's up with you and poetry, brother? Oh, man, let me tell you. Like, where, where, where did this love of poetry come from? Bruh, and it's not love. It's, hey, look. Mr. WKRP. <laughs> and I'm going to look right here. I'm going to look right here. But I'm going to tell y'all, it had nothing to do with Love Jones, man. All right? You know what I'm saying? Brother to the night. <laughs> it had nothing to do with that. But for me, I've been a writer all my life, bro. Okay. And all my friends can tell you back from uh, Our Lady Queen of Peace, i never forget, man. I had this crush on this girl named Angela Watkins, man. I don't know what Angela's last name is now, man, but that's one of my folk. And I remember writing her this poem, man, you know, talking about she had golden head, blah, blah. I mean, it was just crazy. Oh, you went deep. Man, I went deep for a fourth <laughs> grader. So, and I think that's where it started. And it was just like, you know, and they talk, they would talk about that, like the nuns, you know, Sister Lonnie and all of them would say, man, we remember you wrote this poem. <laughs> and they said for a fourth grader, it right. was way above, oh wow, you know, level or whatever. And, and for our group, we had a very smart group of kids um, in my class, and we all scored above our grade level in math and reading. So another cat, William Fairfax, one of my best friends, man, I mean, it was like we used, we used to write all the time. I think William won a national essay competition or something, so he would mm-hmm. tease me about it because, mm-hmm. you know, my writing prowess or whatever. And, uh, you know, once I came out of college, I was a journalist. Oh, wow. Okay. So I was a reporter for Newhouse News Services. So. I worked for the Syracuse newspapers, the Post Standard, and the Herald Journal. And when I was in college, I interned with the Charlotte Observer. Okay. So, and then I also did TV, I did radio. So it was just like writing, like I said, was always my talent. So I think what really kicked it off, I was in Houston when I got into teaching because I trans, I did a transition from being a journalist to teaching to education. Mm-hmm. So I got in this program called Teach for America. Okay. So. I think this was 94, it was in Houston. Mm-hmm. So man, I'm gonna tell you, I, and I used to call all my buddies and I used to say, man, look, y'all just don't know, man, what you missing, you mm-hmm. missing out. Mm-hmm. Man, it was Amazons. And it was just like, and I called them Glamazons. I was like, man, some of the prettiest sisters, man, in the United States are in this program. 
<laughs> so I was just telling them, I was just like, man, and I mean, they were walking around and I was just like, man, I'm definitely, man, this is definitely a candy store, this joint, right? <laughs> right, right. So I remember they had this thing called Cougs, because, you know, Houston Cougars or whatever. Mm. So they had this little club called Cougs. They had open mic night. So I went, and I had been writing poetry for a little while, so I went and p- performed my poetry. Mm-hmm. You know, when I finished, girls was in there crying and stuff. So I was just like, oh, Lord. I said, man, I got something right here. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I said, look, I said, I got something right here. So <laughs> then it was just like, so the next day, I'm sitting in a, a Thai restaurant on campus. Mm-hmm. So one of the sisters came in. She sat down and said, Anton, can you do me a favor? I said, what's up? She said, can you write me a poem? you know, about anything. And I said, all right, I'm going to write you a poem. And, you know, I said, um, I'm going to make it metaphorical or whatever. She said, okay, cool. So I compared her to the Amazon River. Mm-hmm. So when I gave it to her, she read it. Man, she was just like, wow, you know, you felt like this about me. And I said, oh, this joint is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I got a new hustle. <laughs> so, and it's a true story, y'all, true story. Oh you know what I mean? God. So it was just like, I was like, man, and I know, you know, this sister was like one that everybody was liking or whatever, and she just started liking me because of the poetry joy. So I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. So I just started writing poetry. (laughs) I mean, and initially, then it was another sister who was from California, and I remember writing a poem for her, and I was just like, man, this thing is like real easy, man. So that was my first motivation, y'all. I know it's a shame. I'm sorry. You know, I apologize. You got to start somewhere. But you got to start somewhere. (laughs) So, you know, I was writing it for that reason. I was 25 at the time. But it evolved. And I started writing about politics. I started writing about what was happening in D.C. Because at that time, D.C. was, you know, like murder capital. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking about, you know, just us as African Americans sticking together. Um being unified, building things, you know, taking the economics where, you know, we support businesses in our community because the dollars would not circulate. Right. You know, we would take our dollars other places and they would circulate and circulate and circulate in these other communities. Right. right. So it's just like, so for the poetry then, I looked at it as a a way to um, weaponize Mm. us as a people to state what was going on. So in D.C., they had this spot called It's Your Mug. It was 26 and P Street. I'll never forget. And it would be people like DJ Renegade, Tony Asante, Lightfoot, um, you know, just all these heavies when it came to poetry. And they would all perform there, Gail Danley. And it was just like, I said, hey, I want to be a part of this. So I would go every, I think it was Wednesday. Every Wednesday, I was there performing poetry. And I started getting a little following or whatever. And I never looked back. Mm-hmm. And I just start loving to write poetry and um yeah man poetry is a beautiful thing but for me that's just a part of it i love writing writing is writing and getting up and doing public speaking okay you know those i I love to speak in front of crowds um and i love to do the poetry thing yeah because um i remember i saw a video you did (laughs) Yeah, this is Antoine the poet. I said, "Oh, all right, well, that's what we're doing now, right?" Right. So I, was, I, I knew there was a, a story um, behind it. Let's see. Last question. Let me get this call out. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. But I am going to say this real quick, though. Sure. Go ahead. I will say this, man. But the sister who, like I said, the other one. Yeah, I mean it was great. But the sister that I really, really had a crush on, man, that was really digging me. Man, I lost the behind the poetry too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I ain't ready for that. Oh my God. <laughs> the story not supposed to end like that. <laughs> Bro, I'm, I'm saying, I was just like, I remember seeing her because we had Teach for America had this thing in New York. So we were, we were at this club. And it was it was like multi level, and you had like different you had reggae on one, jazz, <laughs> hip hop, all of this. And when she came into the club, she had like this suede big apple hat on, and she pulled it off and shook her head, and her head just fell down her shoulders. I said, "My goodness, man!" So she came down, and everybody said, "Did your girl?" And then you know it was just like we was talking and blah blah blah. So. You know, we went upstairs after a while. She said, I had to talk to you. So we talking. And the last thing she said to me, 
She said, Anton, use your powers for good. She said, don't defile your temple. <laughs> and I was like this. When she said that, I knew it was a wrap. Yeah, you was done. I was done, bro. <laughs> Stick a fork in me. And I know she got up, and then it was like this cat, and it's all white. It was winter white, you know, with the winter cap on or whatever. He rolled up outside, and then she rolled up and said, I got to go. Man, I was crushed. I said, wow, man, poetry can be a blessing and a curse. And a curse. <laughs> <laughs> so Shut you down real quick, didn't Shut you? me down, bro. So, oh, man. Um, I, look, I can't. I can't end this conversation without going someplace I know you want to go. Okay, what's up? I, I know you want to go there because all y'all want to go there. What's up with this Kappa life, man? Y'all, he's a Kappa. Look at him. Yo, he done, he done, he yo, done, yo. <laughs> he done set up in his chair. <laughs> Look, I got a, a good friend of mine on the block. Um, he's a Kappa man as well. My question, though, for real, because uh, I never pledged. Um, being involved with a frat, can you explain how that the benefits of you personally, how it is being involved, especially with a fraternity like that? You know what I'm saying? It's it's caps everywhere, bro. Man, caps let me cues, but yeah, let me tell you, it's scholarship. Um, and it's just like in every field, and just think about it. In every field of, of human endeavor, man, I mean, we're about scholarship first and foremost. And, you know, when I first came on, I, I guess the college scene, my first year, I was like, and? Because I really didn't know anything about Divine Nine. You know, I didn't grow up to where that was like a big part of my family structure. Um, like I said, mom was hardworking, but she didn't go to college. So... Mm -hmm. When I got there and I saw all of this, I was like, oh, yeah, whatever. I'm going to be me for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just saw how those brothers, and not just the Kappas, but the Omegas, you know, the Divine Nine period. I just saw how in the community, you know, these different organizations rolled their sleeves up and helped, mm -hmm. you know, help elevate from tutoring kids to helping homeless folk, you know, taking, um, taking other individuals and working on, you know, homes like, what is it? What is it? What was that thing? The humanity. Habitat for humanity. Habitat for humanities. It was just like so many things. And we started different programs ourselves. Right. So, and even now with, with the whole, what, campaign thing, you know, you had the brothers on um, one night. And I think we raised, it was 55,000 of us that was on. And we raised like $1.3 million. And the night before was the sisters. And mm -hmm. I think they raised like 1.5 or 1.6. Mm -hmm. So, it's power in numbers, and it's not just about wearing T-shirts. So for all of these young young cats who want to pledge these different organizations, if you want to wear the T-shirt, then it's not for you. It's about putting the hard work in. It's about sitting there and being an example of helping people. That's what we do. Now, people see, oh, the Kappas having an all-white party or the Kappas are doing, you know, uh, what is it, seersucker and, sh and cigars and all that stuff, man. That's part of it, but that's like 2%, man. Wow. Okay. The partying piece. You know, people get caught up on, oh, man, you know, well, Kappas, the ladies' men, and, you know, um, AKAs and the Deltas and all. Man, that's not what it's about, right? It's about, so for me, when I got into it, my first year in college, I was freshman class president. Then I was junior class president. So it was about leadership. Mm. So when I saw it, I loved all the organizations. And the funny part was all my boys, we had talked about going to the smoker, right, to, to pledge and that kind of thing. And I got there and I looked around. I said, well, my boys, I was the only one in there. Wow. All them dudes went Omega. And when I talked to them, I said, man, why y'all? They said, man, we ain't tell you because you a Kappa, bro. We Omega men. And it was just like, so it was just for us. We had to do what we had to do. But the beautiful thing about that, Troy, is, man, to this day, those my boys. So it would be like I would be the only capper with all these Omegas, mm -hmm. right? And I love my, my Sands or my line brothers. You know what I'm saying? Our chapter, Alpha Epsilon, Johnson C. Smith. I love my brothers, man. But true friendship, it doesn't matter what affiliation you had. If those your boys in the beginning, those your boys in the end. Mm -hmm. 
That's what true, and as far as men are concerned, that's how men conduct themselves. Those are your boys, those are your brothers, first and foremost. And like I said, those are my brothers also who are cappers. But yeah, man, it's, it's about giving back. And it's, a, it's about the community. It's about uplifting the community. And it was very important. And back then, in those days when the organizations were started, black people had, we needed an organization to where we could come together. Because we were dealing with so much racism, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so much hatred, so much ignorance. But we knew we had black excellence. And that's the thing that a lot of these young kids don't understand. Just about everything in our community or that we see, we create it. That's the crazy part. Like, I read something the other day, and not deviating, but I just wanted to pull this in too. Man, I read that a young brother created the doorknob. What? A a young brother created the doorknob. I never knew that. So I was sitting here like, man, you know what? Out of necessity. We created so many things, right? Right, that we just don't know about. Right. But when we crack open those books and really do research, that's what we did. So that's the bottom line, man. So I look at one of our founders, the dreamer, Elder Watson Diggs, and I just look at you know just Indiana, you know um, where where we were started, and um, the bottom line was because I mean at first we were Cap Alpha Nu, right. Okay. And because of the racism, you know, we ended up changing our name and whatever. But because they would say Kappa Alpha Nigga. That's oh, what they wow. were saying. Okay. So, and, you know, and the sad part about it is just like these kids really got to do their research, man. Do your research before you want to join these organizations. Like I said, it's not about, oh, man, I got to wear that purple and gold. I want to walk around in the black, in the, in the golden boots. Or, man, I want to walk with the cane. Or, I, you know, I, I want to do the shimmy. You know, that you see the Kappas right, doing that right, kind of right. thing. Man, come on, man. That's, that's just a part of it. Like, if you come in with something, bring that intelligence, bring that charisma, you know, bring that charm, bring, you know, that creativity or that originality that you had. Bring that into the fraternity to make it better, to make it stronger so we can make our people strong. It's about elevating. And that's the beautiful thing about the Divine Nine, all of us coming together. And you see all of these beautiful black faces doing their thing. And like I said, I'm not trying to sound, you know, divisive when I say this, but man, it's like Stokely Carmichael said back in the day. I think he said, um, he said black is beautiful or black power. I can't remember which one, but both of them are true, Mm -hmm. right? Black is beautiful. And I want these kids to know that black is a beautiful thing, man. Love the skin that you in. Mm-hmm. You know, don't look down and say, man, I'm a second class citizen. No, you're not. Right. You're just as good as the next culture. Love your culture. And also understand that we are powerful as a people. Right. Know your history. And that's the thing, too. And I know the Alpha brothers, man, I, you know, that I have to say. I got some friends at the Alphas, yeah. Yeah, they all on that history. You know what I'm saying? All of us are all on the history. But, you know, they really talk about that history because, you know, they, they were the first. Right. So... And the thing is, know your history. That's the most, and I'm not just talking about fraternity history. Know your history as a black man, you know, as a father. Know from whence we came and where we're going. And that's the most important thing. So for me, like I said, with the fraternity thing, I love it. Um, You know, like I said, I will advocate for it. Mm -hmm. Because I think that all young black men, and I think that all men, period, should be a part of these organizations. Because, and I'm going to speak specifically for black folk, because it's, it's coming together and being a part, you know what I'm saying, of a fraternal group, altruism, you know, it's so important, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's just like, because working together for a cause to make it better, that we're getting out there. Because when I saw it, like, you know, when were you on that call? I wasn't. I okay. wasn't. But I know, yeah, I, I've right. seen... I've heard a lot of commentary from it. Bro, let me tell you. I heard it was powerful. It was very powerful. When you hear Roland Martin, because mm-hmm. Roland Martin yeah. is the alpha, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you yeah. know, he out there shouting out his alphas and yeah, all of that. Man. And I'm sitting there like this, like, hey, Ro- uh, hey Roland, when you going to put a cap on it, man? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. But then the Kappa brothers would pop on, and they would do their thing, and then you would have Omega brothers pop on. And it was just a beautiful thing just to see the camaraderie, mm-hmm. right? Because although we do have our rivalries, we want to see all of us win, man. It don't matter if you in, if if you in my organization, Cap Alpha Side. You want to see the you want to see the cues flourish. You mm-hmm. want to see 
the um, Sigma's, you know, flourish, flourish mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. You want to see all these organizations do well and shine because it's for our benefit. Right. You don't want to see one fade away because we all need each other. So I think, you know, kind of to, to piggyback on that, that's one of the things that's kind of been a little irritating with me, not as far as the organizations, but just how when we decide that we want to embrace who we are, and it's always from the public perspective, it's looked at as divisive. And I was having this conversation with someone, and I was like, it shouldn't bother you as much as it's bothering you. And again, it always seems to come around when it's election time, especially when Barack was running. Right. <clears throat> I said, but do you realize we've had 46 presidents, 45 have been white men. It's so much ingrained or woven into the fabric of this country that it's just expected. I said, you know, I said if, uh, I'll just say, I'll just say Dominican just because I don't want to put the conversation out there. But I told him, I said, if we had a Dominican become president, saying that that person is the first Dominican president, it's nothing wrong with saying that. It's not divisive. It's a fact. It is what it is. It's being called out because it's never happened. It's never happened, right. So it shouldn't make you uncomfortable that people are taking, like, it seems like when it comes to us, and I know we kind of going off on an offshoot here, but it seems like when it comes to us, when we celebrate who we are, it's always frowned upon but other nationalities, especially in their homelands, they do it all the time. And it's never frowned upon. It, it just is what it is. You go to Chinatown. You go to Little Italy. You go to New Orleans. You go to these places where these cultures are celebrated. But when it comes to us, it's like, oh, it's D.I. or it's this, it's that. And I'm like. But it's like Public Enemy said, fear of a black clan. Because the thing is, ignorance is bliss, man. Mm-hmm. Come on, and, Michael, and when you have a lack of knowledge, you know, and just what I just said, ignorance is bliss. And when you have a lack of knowledge, it's easy to hate something you don't understand. Right. Right. But when people literally get to understand other individuals, man, when you start to respect cultures, then that wall comes tumbling down. Right. Right. So that's that's what the issue is. And it's just like, you know, with us. It's funny how, and I just was saying this the other day, I was on, I was looking at a reel on Instagram, Mm -hmm. one of the reels, and it was an Asian rapper. Mm -hmm. It was a a girl, young lady, and she was flowing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand what she was saying. But you could feel it. But you could feel it, and her flow was so beautiful. And then, you know, you see like the Asians doing some of the dance that we do, dances we do or whatever, and you see them in our communities. A lot of these cultures, Literally, I, I call them culture vultures, mm-hmm. but they literally embrace what we do as a culture. They want to do the things we do, but they don't want to accept us as a people. There you go. And that's the crazy thing because it's like you want to be us from a distance, but when it's all said and done, you want to back away from us because it's taboo. Now we don't want to be a part of that because right. And it's just like, and it's so sad. And it's just like, you know, our kids buying that stereotype. And it's like, dude, right. do you understand, like, from whence we came, do you understand that the smartest individual, IQ-wise, was a black kid mm-hmm. who superseded Einstein? You know what I mean? But people don't know that. I mean, people don't understand the things about, it's like, if you ask these kids, who is Shirley Chisholm? They would look at you like, Shirley who? Mm-hmm. But she's the predecessor. She was the first who ran for president, Mm -hmm. right? So Kamala is standing on giant shoulders. But these kids don't understand that, right? I mean, it's it's sad because kids don't know who Malcolm X is or Martin Luther King, but they don't know who Mega Evers is. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the more you understand your history, the more you understand Nubia, you know, places like that, Kush, Mm -hmm. you know, the more you, you know from way back then, you'll start to love yourself, to know that Alexander, Alexander, you know, the great or whatever, you know, we, we, we talk about him, but do you know Hannibal was black? 
you know, Hannibal, and I think Denzel Washington is supposed to play him, but Hannibal doing a Punic Wars. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on, he beat Rome. Mm-hmm. And uh, with elephants in the Alps. A lot of kids don't know that. So of, it's, it's suppressed. It's very suppressed. A lot suppressed. of the histories. And, I, you know, people get upset when they talk about, even in the Marvel movies, when they start portraying us as more dominant characters. People are like, oh, they change. I'm like, you don't really understand. Like, that to me is why Black Panther was so powerful. Because Stan Lee and them gave credence. Like, they, they showed honor. Like, this is what it really is. Like, exactly. you know, and... Even in rap music, like they were the biggest consumers of rap music aren't black people. It ain't black. It's not black people. You right. know what I mean? And so, um, man, this we we can keep going on. We can bro. go on and on, we, bro. And we gonna we gonna have to do. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you something off air, something I want to do for next year. But we gonna have to continue to have these conversations because I think a lot of what we see, especially you being in the education system. A lot of stuff is, I believe we're at a point where stuff is going to have to be supplemented um, through these conversations, through, as they call this, new media, through these through these different avenues. Because I think about all the stuff my kids don't know because it's not pushed. Some of the history that even this regular history stuff, it really isn't pushed like it used to be. Like right. it used to come up in civics and all that stuff. Because I'm like, is it because now these kids have access to too many search tools that they can really start looking up stuff on their own? But I, I want to continue to have these conversations because, like I said, I think we're going to have to start supplementing on a ground level. Boom. And, and, pl- and plugging in some holes so this next generation coming up can understand some of the things. Because um, it's such a struggle to hold on to power and to hold on to the narratives that I think we're going to have to start implementing our own strategies and figure out ways and we can put content out that's going to really just educate everyone. Because, you know, when I first started this, um, you know, people like, is it, is it black dads? Is it, you know, we, we have some organizations out there that cater to that love them. I said, but I never, I said, if people look at this and they look at me, they're probably going to assume the type of content that we're going to be talking about. And that's fine. But the reason I'm really careful with labels is just because our kids have to go out and live in a real world. And they, and I need to have conversations with other dads that from different communities, different cultures. That's the only way we're really going to bring this thing together. That's how we bridge the gap. Yeah, like right. I need to ha- have my Filipino brothers on here, my Caucasian brothers on here. Let's, let's rap and figure out how we can bring this thing together because – you know, back in when everything was happening with George Floyd, I, I told my wife, I said, I, I li- I've had the benefit of living around the world and, and seeing different people groups. And I said, I'm never really quick with the racism thing. I give people a chance because some of it is racism, but a lot of it is just ignorance. That's it. Because you, I can't fault you because you live in an environment with only people like yourself so you're not going to know anything different but once you're exposed to the information and you have the information then you can make an intelligent decision on your belief system and what but i'm not just going to quickly label something this when if you grew up in middle america with a few hundred people in your town a couple thousand people in your town you're not going to know some things it's just like us we go into certain parts like if you've never at the furthest you've been is Carolina, and you've never traveled. You don't have exposure. You don't. You don't know, and you're right. only you're susceptible to what they're going to pump to you in the media, which oftentimes is just trying to control the narrative, you know. But again, we're going to do this again, man. Um, Anton, bro, I, I appreciate bro. you coming on, man. This has been like I've been over here just learning, and that's why I wanted to do this because I don't have all the answers, man. And we've never been able to just chop it up like this. It's always been through a, hey, what's up? See you later situation with the schools and stuff like that. But thank you. Man, bro, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, and I'm going to just say, because it is very important, man. It's it's very important. Like, knowledge is, is, is power. But the thing that's crazy is, then I would tell people and say, nah, pump the brakes for a minute. Knowledge is not power. Applied, Applied knowledge, knowledge is power. power. Because if you have all the knowledge and you don't apply apply it, you're powerless. Right. Right. So that's the key. And you hit it right on that last segment of, that you just said when you talked about ignorance. 
ignorance again being blissful because ignorance is a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the knowledge, then that's when the problem comes in. Mm -hmm. So bridging that gap is the most important thing, bro. And like I said, thank you, Troy, man. It's, you know, this has been phenomenal. Absolutely, man. Listen, everybody, thanks again for tuning in to another episode. Um, that's all I got. We'll catch you guys on the next one. All right. Take care. Man, that was great, bro. I loved it.